that is obsessed by celebrity, but before social media, before summer blockbusters, before even the concept of a movie star, one extraordinary woman set the blueprint for the stars of today. Never having posted on Instagram without a single tweet, the woman who has been called the world's first superstar captivated both King and Commoner. Sarah Bernhardt, whom the influential French theater critic Francisca Sarce called the incomparable artist, deserves to be remembered. Sarah Bernhardt's official birth records were lost in a fire during the Commune Uprising of 1871, and Sarah was notorious for changing the truth to suit her needs. But she was possibly born in Paris in October of 1844. Her mother, Eu von Hard, was a teenager who had left her Jewish family in the Netherlands to start a life in France. Eu had settled in the demi-monde, the class of women considered to be of doubtful morality and social standing in 19th century France, who were often the courtesans to wealthy and powerful men. While Sarah and her mother were not a part of respectable society, her mother was able to provide her with a comfortable standard of living that included private schooling. Sarah was an emotional young lady who occasionally had outbursts that led to illness when she did not get her way. That passion was a concern when she was young, but it would later become a tool that she would draw upon to capture and enthrall audiences. When Sarah turned 15, her mother convened a group of confidants, including the Duc de Morny, who was the illegitimate half-brother of Louis Napoleon, France's reigning emperor, to discuss Sarah's future. Sarah's marriage prospects were not good. Because of her social status, Sarah would not be accepted by high society, and she lacked grace and tact. While by no means ugly, she did not meet the current idea of beauty, as she was thin, with frizzy hair, and had an unremarkable but not displeasing countenance. Sarah was given a short list of options. Perhaps she could find a working-class man to marry, or an apprenticeship. The Duke suggested the National Conservatory, where Sarah could learn performing arts. Sarah had been determined to become a nun. The man assumed to be her father was Catholic, so she was sent to a convict school for several years. But the conservatory intrigued her, and was the most palatable of the options her mother would prove. An addition was arranged, and perhaps due to the Duke's influence, Sarah was one of a select few admitted to the two-year program. Sarah enjoyed acting and worked hard at her craft, but even in the 19th century, acting was a tough business. Upon graduation, she was given a contract with the Comédie Française, one of a handful of state theaters in France, but her engagement was short-lived, as she had a spat with one of the lead actresses in the company and drew up her contract rather than apologize. The incident also tainted her reputation, and other theaters were hesitant to take on someone who was seen as strong-willed and ill-tempered. Thankfully, her family connections came through for her once again, and her godfather was able to secure her a position with the Théâtre de Gymnase, a theater where she had small parts in light-hearted plays. Her career was interrupted by an affair with a Belgian nobleman, resulting in the birth of her only child, Maurice, in 1864, when she was just 20. And like many women of her time, she made no attempt to conceal her illegitimate child. At the time, the affair gave her a scandalous reputation. But by the time, years later, that the nobleman, Henri, the Prince of Lien, offered to recognize Maurice as his son, her fame had eclipsed his. Maurice politely declined, saying that he was content to be the son of Sarah Bernhardt. She continued acting, often accepting bit parts, to support her and her son. In 1866, she impressed the director of the Théâtre de l'Odéon, another one of the French national theaters, who described her as marvelous gifted. The Odeon featured more modern productions, and it was there where she found roles that suited her, impressed critics, and quickly gained a loyal following. While family connections opened many doors for Sarah Barnhart, they were not enough to make her a superstar. In an era when there was no television, let alone social media, she had a magical combination of skill, passion, persistence, confidence, and willingness to take risks that brought her success. She faced many hardships and losses, but she always leaned on her personal motto, Cond mim, which means all the same, or even so. Just as she was gaining fame and fortune, she lost everything in a fire. Because the fire started with a candle in her apartment, her landlord demanded compensation, so she didn't even have money to replace the household items that she had lost. But her growing notoriety helped her make ends meet when friends and family generously threw a benefit concert that included Adelina Patti, the most famous soprano of her time, and sent monetary gifts. Success on stage was also never guaranteed. In 1868, the Odeon planned a performance of Ribla, a play by Victor Hugo. However, Victor Hugo was exiled at the time for his political views, and the government opposed the performance. The theater managers decided to switch out Ribla for another, less controversial play, and protesters tried to interrupt the performance at the end of the first scene. 
Sarah is credited with challenging the protesters from the stage and ending their disturbance, a brave move that only improved her reputation. In 1879, she performed with a company then touring London and captivated Britain, both on stage and in private performances for the nation's wealthy. She followed that with a tour in the United States in 1880. Her first performance in New York garnered 27 curtain calls. In 2010, National Public Radio said of her popularity in America, she brought Americans to their feet during nine tours, even though she spoke a language most of them did not understand. Mark Twain famously said of her, there are five kinds of actresses, bad actresses, fair actresses, good actresses, great actresses, and then there is Sarah Bernhardt. After 157 performances in 51 cities, she returned to France with a chest filled with $194,000 in gold coins, roughly $5 million today. In her time, she performed for the world's royalty, including Queen Victoria, Alfonso XII of Spain, Franz Joseph I of Austria, and Tsar Alexander III of Russia. She charmed audiences across Europe and the Americas. She was featured in a two-minute scene from Hamlet on film that was played at the 1900 Paris World's Fair, making her one of the earliest screen actors. In a way, her fame founded the medium. The American distribution rights to her 1912 film, The Loves of Queen Elizabeth, one of the first dramatic silent features, established producer Adolf Zukor's famous Players Production Company, which eventually became Paramount Pictures. But her fame went beyond her acting. The website Chicago's Goodman Theater notes that, though she is best remembered for her acting, Bernhardt amplified her fame by creating a cult of personality and myth creating a brand through photographs, gossip, and an ostentatious lifestyle that followed no script. And the Roundabout Theatre Company says of her, she posed for many artists, ensuring that her image would be seen all around the world in paintings, sculptures, photographs, and graphic designs, like Alphonse Mucha's famous Art Nouveau posters. Her intuitive understanding of brand management, plus her extraordinary success as an actor and entrepreneur, established the blueprint for the stars of today. Behind the public image Sarah cultivated, she had private struggles as well. Her mother was rarely present and notably critical of her daughter. Sarah's beloved sister and later her husband both died addicted to opium. She frequently suffered financial setbacks. Sarah seldom, if ever, backed down, and she had no qualms about taking risks to keep the spotlight on her. As her fame grew, so did her offstage stunts. At one point, she bought a coffin to sleep in. She claimed that it helped her understand the mystery of death, but it also kept people talking about her when she had herself photographed in it, dressed in white and surrounded by flowers. In the summer of 1878, Paris held the Exposition Universelle, and one of the key attractions was a tethered hot air balloon that fairgoers could ascend in. A simple lift in the air wasn't enough for Sarah, though. She convinced the balloon engineer to allow her an untethered ride. Along with her current lover and a balloon pilot, they flew over Paris while reciting poetry, drinking champagne, and singing folk songs. Sarah even brought rose petals to drop over the Père Lachaise Cemetery, where her sister and mother were buried. The director of the Comédie Française was so angry that Sarah took the risk to her physical safety that he threatened to fine her for breaking a theater rule, but she simply suggested she would resign instead, knowing he could not afford to lose one of his stars. Bernhardt took the stunt a step further, wrote a book about her balloon flight from the perspective of a chair they took along. Her lover and balloon flight companion illustrated the story, and it became a bestseller. She also had her own peculiar interests that generated plenty of curious gossip. She had a love of pets. She kept ten dogs at her home in Paris. On a theater tour of England, she acquired a wolfhound, a cheetah, and several chameleons. When touring America, she picked up an alligator in New Orleans. A naval officer in Ecuador gave her a tiger cub, and during her last American tour, she was given a lion cub who tore up her hotel rooms and had to be returned to the circus. When she traveled with two of her dogs to Australia in 1891, she faced a dilemma many modern-day pet owners encounter. The country insisted that foreign dogs be quarantined for six months to prevent the spread of rabies. Luckily, another French citizen in Australia offered to provide them shelter for the quarantine. Even when she was not surrounded by animals, Sarah's wardrobe and artistic endeavors drew attention. She wore pants, both for roles in the theater and when working at her home. Bernhardt also took up painting and sculpting. Her detractors rumored that her pieces were finished or touched up by other artists, but she was still allowed to display pieces in the Paris Salon, and even won a medal for a statue in 1876. The statue, Après la Tempête, is housed in the National Museum of Women in the Arts here in America. One might assume someone with Sarah's dramatic personality would be self-centered. However, she showed both patriotism and a willingness to make sacrifices for the benefit of others. When Paris was under siege during the Franco-Prussian War in 1870, Sarah sent her family away from the danger to the country, but stayed in the city to find a way to help. 
The theaters were forced to close, but Bernhardt took the lead in repurposing the Odeon, where she was working, into a hospital for wounded soldiers. She organized workers to create wards in the main parts of the building and rallied friends and businessmen to bring food and supplies. To ensure there were eggs for the hospital, she turned her apartment into a chicken coop for hens and geese and slept at the converted theater. The siege lasted weeks and Sarah became immersed in tending the wounded at the theater turned hospital. At one point she even went with monks to the field to bring wounded soldiers back for care. Ultimately, France was forced to sign a peace treaty and cede Alsace and Lorraine to Germany, but Sarah Bernhardt was awarded a gold medal from France for her efforts and patriotism. Even as she neared the end of her tremendous career, she stepped up for soldiers and her country. In 1914, war once again threatened Paris, and this time Sarah was warned by authorities that she would be a target. Because losing a public icon would have demoralized her countrymen, she left the city with her family. While well, safely in Bordeaux, the 70-year-old actress had her right leg amputated because of pain from a knee injury that would not heal. Yet she still wanted to help her country win the war. As soon as it was feasible to return to Paris, she participated in a patriotic new play called Les Cathedrals as the voice of Strasbourg Cathedral to boost spirits and encourage optimism that France could win the war against Germany this time. Her performances later in life were remarkable for a woman who listed among her greatest fears that she would grow old on stage. In a 1907 autobiography, she wrote, Those who know the joys and miseries of celebrities when they have passed the age of 40 know how to defend themselves. Entertainers visiting troops in the field was not a common occurrence during World War I, but Sarah found out that a group of young actors from the Comédie Française was going to the war zone to perform. She was not about to be left behind. Keep in mind, Sarah had just recovered from an amputation, and she was over 70. Not exactly the ideal scenario for a trip to the front line. However, Sarah not only insisted, she practiced for hours to prove she could do it. The group was persuaded to take her along, and she received a standing ovation for her first performance in front of 3,000 soldiers in northeastern France. This was the start of a packed schedule of performances within range of gunfire that could be taxing for even the younger actors. But Sarah brushed off the danger, saying, We who are near the end of life forget to fear. Sarah refused to let her age or condition slow her down in her efforts to support the war effort. She did a second tour on the front lines, made a motion picture, and then took off for her last American tour in 1916, despite the threat of German submarines, to try and drum up support in the United States. She returned home in 1918 to the news that the war was over. Armistice had happened while she was crossing the ocean. Bernhardt continued working at her theater and creating motion pictures in the years that followed. In 1922, her kidneys began to fail. At the time, there was no treatment for her condition. At 8 p.m. on March 26, 1923, Sarah Bernhardt was pronounced dead at 78 years old. In her extraordinary career, she had played at least 70 roles in 125 plays. While you often hear the line, the show must go on, the night that Sarah Bernhardt passed, the play Le Glon was playing at Bernhardt's theater. When news of her passing came in just the first act, the production immediately ended. Everyone filed out of the theater. The actors didn't even change out of their costumes. They went straight to her home to say their final goodbyes. Almost half a million Parisians lined the streets to view her funeral procession. She was buried in the same coffin she had purchased many years before to sleep in. While her acting charmed the world, the woman who was called the Divine Sarah understood perhaps better than anyone in her age that image was as important as reality. And because of that, she became a centerpiece in the creation of the culture of celebrity. It is perhaps a lesson that she learned on the stage, embodied in her most famous quotation. Legend, she said, remains victorious in spite of history. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the History Guide, short snippets of forgotten history. And if you did enjoy, feed the algorithm by making a comment or clicking that like button. If you have suggestions for future episodes, please send those to our suggestions email box. Check out our webpage at thehistoryguide.net. And of course, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can book a special message from the History Guy on Cameo and check out our merchandise at teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes of Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe.